Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast, where we explore the gospel that Jesus' earliest disciples heard and what the last several decades of historical studies have clarified about this first century Jewish message. Welcome to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. I'm Josh Hawkins, and I'm here again with Bill Schofield and John Harrigan. Howdy, guys. How's your week been? Been good. Good week. Yeah. Yeah, we moved to a new apartment here, which uh, is always exhausting with kids, but uh, we're in a much better place, so loving life in a new place. Good. Awesome. Well, listeners, thanks for joining us again this week. Um, We've got another episode for you on the kingdom of God, and we started back, when was it, early November uh, of last year when we began working through how a first century Jew would have understood the phrase, the kingdom of God, not as a spiritual or metaphysical reality as is commonly understood today, and not as a redefined or inaugurated or realized thing, but as an eschatological geopolitical kingdom ruled by the Messiah the King of Israel, that it's going to be established on the day of the Lord when Jesus the Messiah returns and sits on on a Davidic throne in Jerusalem and rules over the nations. And so we spent several episodes on an introduction and a historical overview. Um, And back in episode 19, we walked through some of the major problem passages in the gospel specifically that are often used to support a realized or inaugurated or spiritual kingdom of God. And we talked about some of the parables in episode 20 and then work through really a number of themes related to or linked with this eschatological kingdom, like the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount and Gehenna and the Messianic Banquet. And then uh, our last one was on prayer, and we specifically looked at the Lord's Prayer. But our main goal in discussing all of those themes was to show that the kingdom, as it was developed in the Tanakh and in Second Temple literature, um, was unchanged in its definition when John the Baptist and Jesus came on the scene preaching. And there's so much more that we could say um, about those passages in the Gospels, but today we want to briefly discuss what Paul writes in his letters about the kingdom. Because just like Jesus in the Gospels, uh, there's an overwhelming number of passages that Paul um, uh, just keeps the the idea of the kingdom of God squarely within a first century Jewish apocalyptic framework. And there's a small handful of passages that aren't quite as clear, at least on the surface, and those few are typically used to support uh, an entire scheme of realized or inaugurated eschatology. So we want to take a look at some of those today as well um, and show you that we believe that there's no redefinition or reimagination of Jewish eschatology going on at all, specifically with the kingdom of God um, in Paul's mind. So guys, let's jump in. I think first, you know, we really have to recognize what I said, you know, there's so much continuity between John the Baptist and Jesus. So for Paul, the Messianic kingdom uh, is not some spatial or metaphysical reality. It simply is temporally at hand, just like with Jesus and John the Baptist. And, and the question is not, well, okay, Paul is now setting up some new framework. So what do we do that where we put it? But simply the same question that was asked by Jesus and John the Baptist is, well, what does this all mean? And what is the response that, that uh, is required as a result? And so let's dig into this a little bit, guys. Like, how does Paul address the kingdom, and and what is he thinking about Jewish eschatology? Yeah, I mean, I, I think part of the problem is is that we have occasional letters written by Paul uh, to situations that are pastorally oriented, where people have already been uh, evangelized, things have already taught already. Paul has already taught for hours and hours and days and days on end uh, to these Gentile audiences, generally Gentile. And so you have in his letters these references to major redemptive themes that are central in Jewish apocalyptic thought, specifically the day of the Lord or the day of Christ Jesus, the resurrection of the dead, the age to come, um, and the coming wrath of God. Uh, And they're never explained, you know, so like in Philippians 1, I pray that, you know, the good work that God began, he'll bring to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. And he never explains what the day of Christ Jesus means. Or in 1 Corinthians 15, when he's talking about the resurrection of the dead, it's uh, these things are referenced usually without detailing any kind of redemptive history as a whole. So the kingdom of God is the same way where 
it's referenced like in first Corinthians, you know, uh, chapter six, where, you know, I tell you the truth, the immoral, the thieves, sorcerers, etc., will not inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, but that's what some of you were. And so he makes these references that are massive, life and death, eternally to the kingdom of God, but doesn't define it anywhere. And so when you look at Paul, it's making references to Jewish apocalyptic themes, assuming them without defining them. Uh, I think the framework fits better that if you interpret and we talked about this in previous episodes, the novelties of Paul within a Jewish apocalyptic framework, rather than redefining it, I think really captures who Paul was. So when he talks about the death of the Messiah, the cross, the gift of the Spirit, and the mission to the Gentiles, which are basically those are the three novelties within Paul, uh, interpreting those novelties within a Jewish apocalyptic framework rather than interpreting those novelties as a redefinition of that framework gives us a better approach to Paul as a whole. Yeah. 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 That's good. I, I often, when I, uh, when I talk with people about Paul or people are trying to work through one of his letters, um, there's some, you know, there's some practical things like John mentioned the pastoral and and really specific nature of them. Uh, keeping that in mind is really helpful. Um, but but also in a broader sense, understanding how Paul sees or how he communicates what he's doing, because people kind of subconsciously just automatically, w- without any word from Paul, without anything textual, they they play into their reading of Paul the idea that he he's motivated because he's establishing Christianity as a movement that he sees is going to take over the world. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's so many assumptions that we start with with Paul, right? We say, okay, he was converted when he met Jesus and he went from being a Jew to being a Christian, and therefore... All of his ideas, From Saul all of to those, Paul. yeah, right. <laughs> all of those crazy old Jewish ideas of you know a, a Davidic throne and a Messiah and the nations flowing up to Jerusalem. That all those kind of went out the window, right? Correct. And for the record, Jesus did not change Saul's name. That's right. Paul. <laughs> Paul is simply the Greek form, and and Saul is would be the the more Jewish. The more Jewish form. It's amazing how mind blowing that fact is to so many people who have heard so many sermons about, oh, well, he, he became Paul and Jesus called him Paul. And so he's a new person and he's a new Christian and he's a new everything. And then you realize, wait a minute. No, weird. one's just his Greek name and one is his Hebrew name. <laughs> it's, it's really weird how easily you can get away with it because everybody is yeah. assuming Paul represents the, the, the founder of Christianity. Paul represents that, like, this is the drive of Paul, is to establish Christendom. Right. And so this is entirely misreading and really unhelpful. Yeah, yeah I think, you know, one of the things that historical studies have really highlighted in relation to Paul is you get so many references in his letters to the nearness of the day of Christ Jesus, the nearness of the time of the end. And this is critical, really, to understanding Paul, because it's that view of the nearness that connects him to his native Jewish apocalyptic worldview. It's it's those references like 1 Thessalonians 4, when he says, those of us who are alive at his coming will be caught up. And so Paul had in mind that Jesus was returning within his lifetime, that it was at hand, you know, Philippians Philippians 4, the Lord is at hand, therefore don't be anxious about anything. Paul was living out his life like Romans 13, you know, you know what hour it is, our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed the night is far gone, the day is at hand. And so the, you know, Paul was just as adamant 20 years into his ministry as the day he encountered Christ Jesus, 
that salvation, the resurrection, and the appearance of Christ Jesus in the clouds with angels and fire, like that's Second Thessalonians 1, that that was any day at hand. And if, if you don't, if you don't take that seriously, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that, by the way. That this is how all the prophets functioned in, in the prophetic literature. The day of the Lord is at hand, a day with thick clouds and smoke, etc. Uh, Isaiah 13, the Zephaniah, the, the day was at hand in the prophetic literature. The day's at hand to John the Baptist. The day is at hand. You know, throughout the the epistles and the pastoral letters, there's nothing wrong with that. It's right. the urgency of the oracle that, you know, t- to God, the judgment is at hand. But we kind of read 2,000 years of history back into it, and that really, I think, distorts how we perceive Paul in his native environment. So... Uh, a great quote is just the beginning of Paula Fredrickson's book on Paul, um, which I think we all love here, yeah. minus her uh, kind of uh, lack of focus on, on the cross and theology of the cross. But she says, the kingdom of God, Paul proclaimed, was at hand. His firm belief that he lived and worked in history's final hour is absolutely foundational shaping everything else that Paul says and does. And his conviction is all the more remarkable when we consider that by the time that we hear from him, mid-first century, the kingdom is already late. We easily lose sight of this fact. Our historical perspective obscures it. We look backward and, for good reason, see Paul's epistles as, quote, early, a mere couple of decades after Jesus' execution. But while history is always done backward, life is lived only forward one day at a time. And she goes on a little bit and concludes, Paul lived his life as we all must live our lives, innocent of the future. As historians, we conjure that innocence as a disciplined act of imagination through appeals to our ancient evidence. Only in doing so can we begin to see Paul as Paul saw himself as God's prophetic messenger formed in the womb to carry the good news of impending salvation to the nations, racing on the edge of the end of time. So good. Which I think is a really great quote just because it really kind of captures that Paul, like that driving motivation that kept him day in and day out with such intensity was the eschatology, the eschatological fervor that was part and parcel with his Jewish apocalyptic heritage. Yeah, that's, that's great. I love Fredrickson. Yeah. And his, and, and you find, and you find a lot of that, that language uh, littered throughout, especially in in First and Second Corinthians, because there's because he's having like John was referencing the, the the situation on the ground. There's a lot of awkward things going on on the ground there, and so he's constantly answering accusations about his own ministry there. And so the way he the way he defines his life and ministry are really helpful in some of those passages for me, like. Uh, <clears throat> um, well, a little bit later on, we'll read a little bit from 1 Corinthians 4, but 2 Corinthians 4 is, you know, well-known as well, where we have the treasure in, in clay jars, and we're afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in, uh, not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be visible in our bodies. And and he's going to reference, you know, the resurrection in a few different ways. And he ends this little section by saying, so we are we don't lose heart in light of all the afflictions and things, even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day for this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure, because we look not at what can be seen, but what cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what is cannot be seen is eternal. And the point of being seen and unseen is essentially 
Paul's just referencing all the things that are foretold by the prophets. Those things are the way that we're able to live our lives right now are because we can carry about in our bodies the death. We can associate with the death of Jesus and all the afflictions that we endure because we know that the resurrection is around the corner. And so, and, and, you know, obviously still going to inherit those things, but, but in all of these descriptions, there's such a, in his, his way of describing why he lives with such intensity or like, obviously second, second, uh, this or second Timothy four towards the end, when he's looking back at his life, he's talking about his drive to finish the race in light of inheriting an imperishable crown in the kingdom of God. And like, this is how we really need to read Paul. Like, like this is the Paul that is talking about the kingdom of God. This is the Paul, even the quote unquote, you know, problem passages, because generally everybody reads Paul is generally eschatological, but you get to, you know, two, three passages and you go, and here's where Paul really is very already, but not yet focused. And we'll get into those, but but these things are really how you read Paul and get where Paul's at and get where he's speaking from so that his letters can start to make sense. Yeah, yeah, amen. Yeah, and a lot of, you know, uh, on the team here this semester, we're working through 1 Corinthians uh, just kind of as a team. And and uh, so 1 Corinthians is really fresh on my mind. We've been teaching it and and... There's so much in Paul's logic that assumes the two ages, you know, like you referenced in Second Corinthians four, we're we're always being given over to death for Jesus's sake, so that his life might be manifest in our bodies. And so, if you don't have the two age framework that we're given over to death and martyrdom right. in right. this age, so that his life will be manifest in our bodies in the resurrection, Yeah. then that gives the whole drive, which, you know, Paul goes on right after that and says, for our light and momentary affliction in this age is producing an eternal weight of glory in the age to come. But Paul, you know, Paul assumes that kind of two-age framework. In 1 Corinthians, you know, in chapter 1, he sets up the whole thing about you have all these sectarian divisions among you, people following after Paul, Apollos, you know, little cultic sectarian movements within the church at Corinth. And Paul chose the foolish things to confound the wisdom. And so he sets up the whole thing of this age, those who are wise will actually be confounded and not inherit eternal life. But you who are foolish and weak in this age, because you believe in the death of the Messiah on your behalf, you will actually inherit the age to come. And so the two age, it's a little bit like Jesus with the first will be last and the last will be first. If you don't have the two ages... Of the first in this age will be the last in the age to come. The last in this age are going to be the first in the age to come. If you don't have the basic two ages, then you miss the whole logic of everything. Yeah. And so uh, there's so much in Paul's letters that if you don't have the two ages, you don't have the driving mechanism of discipleship and perseverance in this age unto the glory and the hope and the drive for the age to come. Yeah, that's exactly it, man. And things get even wildly more confusing when if instead of a two-age scheme, you kind of mix the ages together and bring one upon the other. And, you know, it turns into even like what we talked about last week, it turns into a game of, of uh, you know, some sort of metaphysical or, you know, sovereign kind of divine sovereignty conversation as opposed to um, more of a discipleship conversation right. uh, of what Paul is right. trying to address in, in these passages. So, um, well, guys, let's uh, let's jump into some of these passages from Paul, um, and let's just look at a number of passages where it's super clear. I mean, we've already referenced a bunch here, but it's super clear that he's referencing a 
future day of the Lord, an age to come, a resurrection of the dead, coupling that with the kingdom of God, as in the Davidic kingdom, Jewish apocalyptic, first century Jewish apocalyptic framework. I mean, all of this is continuing to play out in all of his letters. So let's look at a few passages. I think the first one that comes to mind is 1 Corinthians 15. Yeah. So uh, 1 Corinthians 15, the whole, the, really the whole, the whole section, if you, if you're familiar with it, it's not difficult to understand really. But um, so like just in uh, like from verse 50 to 52, brothers, I tell you this, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God and corruption cannot inherit incorruption. Listen, I'm telling you a mystery. We will not all fall asleep, but we will all be changed in a moment in the blink of an eye at the last trumpet for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we will all be changed. So again, Paul Paul has that that interesting uh, way of of talking, just like in in First Thessalonians that uh, John referenced above, where what he's saying is we will not all fall asleep, and he's he's among those who may not die before the last trumpet and before the resurrection. So again, Paul sees himself right right there, like Paula said. What, what did she say? On the edge, like riding on the edge of time or something like that. Yeah, the, the razor's edge of the end of time. Ah, yeah. So much better than <laughs> so I could good. have said it. Yeah, and you know, that this passage really kind of embodies the climactic sudden change that is impending upon the world. You know, it, yeah. it's not going to be a slow kind of progressive, but it's going to be a radical opening of the heavens with he- with angels and fire and a sudden dramatic. Paul Paul brings it to like a com- climactic moment. The twinkling of an eye is the day of God and the resurrection. And there's a lot of debate in the academy around 1 Corinthians 15 and basically what Paul is opposing in Corinth as a whole, whether it's uh, kind of a generic kind of Hellenistic, uh, you know, uh, incorporeal hope of of the material world's bad and the, the immaterial world's good. And so there's no need for the resurrection of the dead. Or if he's arguing against some sort of realized eschatology, you know, from chapter four, you have already been ca- been made kings, etc. Uh, and I, I kind of tend towards the former. A lot of people will kind of mix the two together, and I would say yes, there's probably some of both. But I think this, in, in at the end of First Corinthians fifteen really highlights the logic specifically concerning Paul's push against the kind of proto-realized eschatology that's going on in Corinth. And because in Jewish apocalyptic literature, you got you get a lot of references to the age to come being the age of incorruptibility, and this age being the age of corruptibility. And so, for example, like 2 Baruch 44 yeah, it says, uh, for that which is now is nothing, but that which is in the future will be very great, for everything will pass away which is corruptible, and everything that dies will go away, and all present time will be forgotten, and there will be no remembrance of the present time which is polluted by evils, and that period is coming, which will remain forever. And there's the new world, which does not carry back to corruption those that enter into its beginning. For those are the ones who will inherit this time of which we have spoken. And to these is the is the heritage of the promised time. And so you get this view of the age to come as being incorruptible and that there won't be any corruption in the age to come, which this is kind of what Paul is assuming in 1 Corinthians 15 is right. that, look, flesh and blood corruption cannot inherit the kingdom of God 
why would Paul say that other than people are teaching that people are inheriting the kingdom of God now? And Paul's right. like, <laughs> yeah. flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom of God. There's going to come a radical moment in which the spirit of God transforms us in the resurrection. And that's how God is going to purge corruption and incorruptibility will inherit that which lasts forever. And it's going to come suddenly at the day of Christ Jesus. And so I think this passage really is kind of embodies how Paul views history moving towards the climactic end at the day of Christ Jesus. Yeah. Amen. That's great. Also, also like to add here, I, I love the, uh, you know, for in, in, in light of what we mentioned um, a couple of weeks ago and the episode on prayer, that the Amidah, which we at least mentioned in passing, uh, an, a really old version of the Amidah that was found, uh, the second blessing in the Amidah is about the resurrection from the dead. And it, and, and it actually, this is the only other place I know in antiquity that, that uses the language. It says, oh, um, sustaining, you sustain the living, you'll resurrect the dead. Oh, cause our salvation to sprout in the twinkling of an eye. So it's likely that that even that kind of reference just came from, like we've been saying all along, from an existing Jewish tradition that the Corinthians already would have known about when he's speaking about it. So he didn't have to insert all of the exact language of this and that, because the framework is inserted with little things like that when he references them. So good. So good. Well, let's look at another one. How about uh, how about Galatians five? Yeah. So you know, Paul's referencing uh, in Galatians five the work of the spirit, you know, versus the work of the flesh. Uh, which again, the spirit in Paul's mind is associated with the activity of the Holy Spirit, uh, climaxing in the resurrection, the age to come. And the work of the flesh, you know, the flesh representing this body before the resurrection. And so it's kind of a two age. The works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, etc., etc. And he says, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, etc., etc., and the logic behind it, you know, we know what Paul is referencing because he goes on in chapter 6. He says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his flesh, who sows to this body and this life, will reap from the flesh corruption or destruction, other translations. Um, but the one who sows to the spirit will reap eternal life. And so Paul has, you know, associates the kingdom of God with eternal life. And the opposite of that is uh, destruction and the punishment of the wicked. And so it's, it's, it's not like Paul has to define anything. This is just kind of the, the assumed framework that he's working out the issues of discipleship and Torah observance among the Gentiles. Yeah. And, you know, people will kind of f so focus in on the specific novelty that Paul is dealing with and how do we deal with the Torah and Gentiles who are turning to the God of Israel and how do we work out the issues of discipleship there that they'll, they'll kind of reinvent and say, well, Paul's inventing novelties about the framework of redemptive history as a whole. And, you know, I just don't see yeah. that doesn't seem to be the case. The case right. seems to be that right. he's simply assuming that view of history that Jews held, the, you know, not everyone, but the majority, the apocalyptic view, and he's doing discipleship within it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think the parallel passage to Galatians 5 would be Ephesians 5. Um, same themes, same thing with the spirit, um, and and in terms of who inherits the kingdom, working out details of discipleship. So Ephesians five, verse five, Paul says, "For you may be sure of this: that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or who is covetous, that is an idolater, who has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God." 
Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. So again, the, the assumed framework of Jewish apocalyptic eschatology at the time, he's not having to work out new ideas or reframe things. He's simply pulling on that existing framework and encouraging discipleship and, and uh, using eschatology as a discipleship mechanism. As, as we've said often, you know, eschatology is what drives discipleship. And this is exactly what Paul is doing in this parallel passage to what you said, John, Galatians 5, here in Ephesians 5. So what about another one? How about uh, like 1 Thessalonians 2? Yeah. So in 1 Thessalonians 2, Paul says, you are witnesses and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. For you know how like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. And so you get the same language of kingdom and glory, which Paul assumes, like in Ephesians 5, is associated with the coming wrath of God. So at the end of chapter 1, he says, For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you, how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, to wait for his Son from heaven, who ra- whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. And so the wrath to come and being called into the coming kingdom and the glory to come was kind of the basic discipleship driver for Paul and how he related in his letters. So uh, it's another example of Paul referencing the kingdom, and he's just assuming kind of uh, a uh, presupposed framework of history. And and even there just reminds me of what John said above and and. Like it's almost it's almost worth like repeating before every passage. Yeah. yeah. Um li- like the like the point of Jesus delivers us from the wrath to come, so we must wait for him. Mm. It it assumes that these that there's an eschatological trigger for everything at the coming of Jesus. Yeah. And so everything is oriented around the coming of Jesus because that is that is what triggers all that the prophets have said. I think we've mentioned that in the past, but but it has to be said, it has to be remembered when you come to these passages that that you know that uh, you know whether whatever it is, you know he's you're considered worthy, or you're um, he calls you to his kingdom and glory. These aren't progressive events. These are these are events that are clearly fixed in Paul's mind, clearly fixed in the mind of all of Jesus' disciples at this point. And when you read them, if you don't keep it in mind, the the references to waiting for his son from heaven and things like this, you, you kind of play them out as just, you know, some sort of expectation of a progressive, you know, movement that's happening. And this is this is really what kind of destroys the reading of Paul when he's clearly writing about things with urgency and he's speaking with really intense language, like, uh, you know, the next letter to the Thessalonians, second Thessalonians in chapter one, he, um, he says, therefore we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and the afflictions that you're enduring. This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be considered worthy for the kingdom of God for which you're suffering, since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well. As to us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. So the point again here is the is the the trip switch is Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. And until then, we see our suffering as actually testifying to what the judgment's going to look like. God's going to vindicate. And so that's the present part. The present part is when, when you experience afflictions and trials of many kinds, 
you are filled with joy because it's evidence about how the trial's going to go down. Yep. Right. So, so th- this is, this is, uh, th- these passages in Paul are just, they're such, uh, however you want to frame, you know, Paul and how he's interacting with them, a- at his core, he's just functioning as a good shepherd. This is like how you shepherd someone in light of the end of the age and, and apocalyptic expectation. Well, yeah, and there seems to be like this fundamental misunderstanding that like eschatology somehow messes up discipleship, when in reality, it's the eschatology that is the driver. It's it's the thing that makes it happen. It's yep. and if right. we you know if we refer to it as hope, you know this is kind of Jurgen Moltmann, his kind of he he was really influential in his theology of hope and kind of a reviving of Jewish apocalyptic expectations in contrast to Rudolf Bultmann. But it's the theology of hope that is actually what, it's the main mechanism for discipleship for Paul. It's not the distraction. It's the anticipation of eternal life and the resurrection that makes possible faithful perseverance. And so, you know, the, the parallel passage to Second Thessalonians 1 is Philippians 1, where Paul says, only let your life, your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, uh, standing firm with one mind, striving for the faith of the gospel, not being frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction but of your salvation and that from God. For it's granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. And so the the background is that Paul is assuming that they have preached to their opponents that God is having mercy on them until Mm, the coming judgment, that he wants to extend mercy and salvation from the wrath to come, and that them suffering is a sign that God is long suffering and that he's going to reward the righteous and punish the wicked. And that our restraint from vengeance is a testimony to God's restraint from vengeance. And that when we lash out and we exact justice upon right. our enemies, that that actually contradicts the sign. It contradicts the testimony Absolutely. that God is having right. mercy on his enemies. And right. so that's Paul's logic is that the eschatology defines the discipleship, the, the eschatology and the hope is what actually makes it possible to walk worthy of the testimony that we're talking about. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think so uh, you know, just in a practical sense, being around different settings like this for a while, I, I think because, because the mechanism for discipleship is so inherent with a delay of the reward for how you've lived now, and it's so inherent in the eschatology of hope, of judgment, of resurrection, <laughs> yeah. that the reason the reason that gets in the way of discipleship is because since that's been removed, discipleship is so complex. It just takes so much time. Yeah. Like the programs yeah. are so <laughs> elaborate to try to disciple someone. Yeah. And so and it's such a headache. Yeah, exactly. It, yeah. Totally. It, it, gets, it gets in the way because the process of discipleship has, has needed to be so elaborate and complex that anything else just gets in the way because discipleship like requires all these artificial mechanisms that we have to make up. And so people can't focus on anything else for a while right? because you got to focus <laughs> on the artificial mechanisms. Uh, and so eschatology and anything else just gets in the way. Right. And I, you know, I think of it like, like I tell my kids, we're going to have like this massive, you know, trip and we're going to do all this fun stuff. And it's like, it's the anticipation of that that is actually the driver for, it's the mechanism for discipleship in a lot of ways that I'll say, we have to do this, 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 and this before we can go on our trip. You have to do your exactly. chores. You yeah. have to be obedient. You can't be mouthy, disrespectful, 
et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and expect to get the reward. And so you get all yeah. this theological right. malarkey that comes in saying, oh, no, realized eschatology <laughs> is actually the driver. And an analogous, it would be me rewarding my kids and me telling them, you know, their allowance and my feeding them. And, you know, at every point I'm saying this and this, the that all of my blessing is the mechanism for them <laughs> to go on the big trip. And it's like, what are you talking about? The, it makes no it's sense. It's the anticipation and the expectation <laughs> of the future that is the mechanism. Yeah. It's not the thing that gets in the way. Yeah. And so this happens in Paul, I think, where you just get this train wreck of theology that comes in as the supposed mechanism for discipleship, which it's actually the thing that wrecks it. And so the whole totally. thing is just a mess. Yeah, and the classic <laughs> way that we think about discipleship here in the West is, oh, well, you know, let's get together and let's talk about Jesus and let's talk about how great his love is and, you know, then say, oh, well, we should stop sinning because he loves us so much and because it's bad or something. And, you know, like... I mean, Paul's entire thrust here, as as I hope that our listeners are, are hearing, is eschatology. It is the mechanism for which he goes, hey, this is why you should live, basically live in light of your destiny. Right. If in the age to come, there's going to be no slander and no sexual immorality, live in light of that now as a witness embracing suffering as the Messiah himself did for taking a stand for the, uh, for living as God has called us to live. And, yeah. and know that your reward is coming on the day of Christ Jesus. That's great. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, a passage that embodies that is, uh, Second Timothy four, where Paul says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead by his appearance and his kingdom. Preach the word, being ready in season, out, yeah. repu re reprove, rebuke, exhort, etc. And so people kind of like, they'll just treat like, you know, the charge of, of Timothy in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who's to judge the living and the dead and the appearing in the kingdom. They'll treat that like background information. Right. Like, <laughs> this is just Paul saying peace and grace to you. You know, it's like, no. This is the framework for Timothy's discipleship. Yeah. And if you don't have his coming judgment, his appearance, the resurrection, and his kingdom in mind, then you're not going to have faithful ministry and discipleship, preaching of the word. And then he goes on saying, because there's going to come false teachers, people tickling people's ears, leading people astray into myths. And the assumption is, is that the false teachers are doing that because of chapter six, the knowledge so falsely called the spiritualizing, the realizing like Hymenaeus and Philetus saying the resurrection's already happened, that it's actually the distortion of the eschatology that creates the distortion of the discipleship. I don't know if one of you guys want to jump in with, you know, him fighting the fight and running the race and verse 18. And even more than that, I think, you know, it's not just for Timothy, but Paul himself views his own discipleship as framed and driven by his eschatological outlet outlook when he says, for I'm being poured out as a drink offering in verse eight, verse six, my time of departure has come. I fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. Henceforth has laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge will award to me on that day, assuming the day of his appearing, the day of the judgment, the day of the kingdom, and not only to me, but to also all who have loved his appearing. And so it's the loving of the appearing that is the driver for the keeping the faith, the fighting the fight, the finishing the race. And the assumption is, is that if, if there's not the appearing that's central, if there's not the hope of the kingdom and the resurrection, then people aren't going to fight the fight and run the race. Right. And so, and then he totally. goes on to say, you know, giving the contrast, Demas, verse 10, was in love with this present world mm. and deserted me. And so Demas, 
and uh, and Alexander the coppersmith in verse 14, these are presented as the contrast because they love this world rather than the appearing. And then Paul goes on, verse 18, the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory and honor forever. And of course, Paul doesn't have in mind an immaterial heavenly destiny. He has in mind the day of Christ Jesus and the, the messianic kingdom in the age to come on a new earth with resurrected body because it's heavenly. The heavens will open. It's the quality of the coming kingdom. And so, but this again is kind of Paul has, it's the thrust of his own discipleship and faithfulness to the end. Yeah, absolutely, guys. Well, now that we've taken a little bit of time to look through some of these um, real clear, real unquestionably eschatological passages from Paul, let's take a look at just a a small handful here. I mean, we're, we're pulling out three from some of Paul's letters that might be considered problem passages or passages that are almost always read through uh, the lens of inaugurated or realized eschatology, where where Paul then is presumed to be operating from an already but not yet framework because of these few passages. Um, and I think the first one... Paul's assumed to not be able to carry a coherent thought for three <laughs> verses. <laughs> It's what the problem is. <laughs> right, right. Well, yeah, it, it's it's pretty wild how these three tend to uh, tend to really make us think exactly that. So this first one uh, is Romans fourteen, and this is Romans fourteen verses thirteen to nineteen. Paul says, "Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother." I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it, it thinks it unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you're no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom the Messiah died. So do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So let us then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. So that phrase, the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. I don't know, guys, that sounds kind of already, but not yet to me. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I don't honestly, I don't actually know how you can have a coherent explanation of what the kingdom of God is here <laughs> if it's not eschatological. What what does it mean? Is it the church? Right. Is he saying the church in, in Rome is always a matter of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit? <laughs> what is he talking about? So so like like think about the context. So, you know, you have on the heels of you know, nine, ten, eleven, and the discussion about the restoration of Israel and 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 God's eternal calling, and and then seems to kind of shift a little bit, and and he's and he kind of shifts to more of these pastoral focuses, but the but the context has never changed. The context is always maintained, yeah. like like uh, the, the just before this in Romans thirteen, where you and I think this is really kind of what gives a framework for a number of Paul's statements that are misunderstood is uh, where, where he says, you know, like John quoted earlier that the daytime is, uh, is, you know, is almost here. So don't, so clothe yourself in an armor of light, meaning clothe yourself as, as, you know, as looking like the daytime and the daytime and the nighttime are in the Psalms and in the prophets are references to the age to come and this age, it's a it's a contrast between the two. The age to come, of course, being the age of light. And so the point is in Romans thirteen, <clears throat> cast off. This is Paul's kind of lead in to Romans fourteen. So cast off the deeds of this age, and clothe yourself in the deeds that will be native to the age to come. This yeah. is kind of the work of the Spirit among you. Because so like when you're having these quarrels about things that don't matter, those things don't matter in the kingdom of God. When when the kingdom of God comes, nobody's going to be concerned about these things. So give yourselves as a testimony, give yourselves to the things that matter in the kingdom of God. Give yourselves to the things that are going to matter in the day of judgment. Like when the day of judgment comes, what is going to what are going to be the issues that matter when you stand before your maker? 
And so he's simply boiling it down using, again, he's using the logic of what they already knew about the kingdom of God to just explain in simple, very plain terms, they ought to act in light of their calling, in light of their destiny. Yeah, That's actually a rather straightforward passage. It's actually one of the more straightforward passages that is often really confused for some reason. Right. And even, I mean, right before that, Paul says explicitly, why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it's written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will confess to God. So each of us will give an account of himself to God. And so you can exchange, you know, just a few verses later, the kingdom of God and the day of judgment are interchangeable because they happen simultaneously, you know, in the twinkling of an eye, a sudden uh, cataclysmic. And so you could say for the day of judgment is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So for Paul, it's not a a problem to talk about the future reality of the thing as the determining factor for what's important. That makes sense to him, right? So what is important eschatologically defines what should be walked out in a worthy manner now. It makes sense to him. You, you, The way you walk in a manner worthy in this age is by having the value system of what's important in the age to come define what is important here. So in Romans 14, Paul is arguing that specific kosher laws and the observance of the Jewish calendar are not going to be important for Gentiles at the judgment. I don't think Paul would say they're not important for Jews, but he's arguing that for Gentiles, those things are not ultimately important. But the judgment and the kingdom of God is going to be about the resurrection and the spirit and what the spirit produces and righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And so the day of judgment is not a matter of eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. It's like talking about, you know, someone uh, you know, I think of, I use like a an inheritance example. So Bill Gates might, you know, say to his son about his inheritance, your inheritance isn't a matter of of weight of video games and 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 you know <laughs> recreation. Your inheritance is about inheriting this corporation and this massive movement that I've been building for years. Like it's It's Paul refocusing the Romans to say, this is what is ultimately important, and this is what the future holds for you. And so, I, like you said, Bill, I don't see how you can read Romans 14 and that statement about the kingdom of God as being anything other than eschatological, because it doesn't make sense otherwise. Exactly. Mm -mm. Exactly. Well, let's look at another one, guys. 1 Corinthians 4. Um, Paul says, 1 Corinthians 4 verse 15 to 21, and another classic one. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then be imitators of me. This is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in every church. Some are arrogant as though I were not coming to you, but I will come to you soon if the Lord wills. And I will find out not the talk of those arrogant people, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in, or uh, NIV says is not a matter of, the N- New Revised says it depends not on talk, but in power. I'll say that again. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love in a spirit of gentleness? Well, what is Paul trying to say here? The kingdom of God does not consist in or is not a matter of talk, but power? What does he mean here, guys? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. You know, I think this is a classic example of you'll read in commentaries and you'll hear people preach on this of like schizophrenic Paul, like Paul <laughs> all before, you know, he starts out the letter that they would be, you know, strong in the gifts of the spirit, that they would be sustained to the end, to the day of Christ Jesus. You know, he... he 
Chapter 3, he's talking about each man's labors will be revealed by fire, his disciples will be revealed by fire, and each one will be tested on the day that will disclose it. And then in chapter 4, he's talking about don't judge anything uh, before uh, the Lord comes in verse 5. Um, and then you get to the end, and he makes the reference there to the kingdom, not consisting in talk, but of power. And then chapter 5, right after that, he's talking about the sexually immoral man and that you hand him over to Satan so that his spirit will be saved in the day of the Lord. And then chapter 6, you know, the, the wicked, verse 9, and or just the whole argument of chapter 6 is the discipleship. You know, you're going to judge angels, but you're getting into lawsuits over each other. And I'm telling you that the wicked and the, the sexually immoral won't inherit the kingdom of God. So you have eschatological references all surrounding the end of 1 Corinthians 4. There's no reference whatsoever to some sort of realization of eschatology and all of the issues of discipleship that are going on surrounding in chapter 3 and in chapter 5 and 6. But somehow in chapter, at the end of chapter four, Paul makes this massive statement about the kingdom of God being a manifestation of the power of the spirit, which I just, that makes no sense to me whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. And so <laughs> really I does. think, you know, I think it, it makes much more sense that he's simply saying, you know, a, a friend of ours, Tim Miller, he, uh, he preached on this passage one time and he says, you know, Jesus isn't going to return and judge the wicked with footnotes. <laughs> it's not a matter of talk. The coming, the coming kingdom of God is a matter of divine judgment and the kingdom of God, the purging of the powers in the heavens and the kings on the earth, Isaiah yeah. 24. And yeah. so the kingdom of God is a serious reality that you don't argue away with your little, you know, sectarian cults that are happening in Corinth at the time. And he's saying, it's a matter of power. And so should I come to you and demonstrate that power with a whip, with a rod, like Jesus is going to do on the last day? Or should I come to you in gentleness with correction? And so he goes on to say, you know, in chapter five, that Deal with the guy who's sexually immoral and unrepentant with a rod to try to awaken him, to try to bring sobriety so that his spirit will be saved on the day of the Lord. And so he's simply saying that, look, some of you are arrogant and I want you to come to grips with reality to bring some sort of sobriety because the kingdom of God is not going to unfold. The day of judgment is not going to unfold with a bunch of arguments that you like you guys right. are doing with some saying, I follow Paul and Apollos and Peter and etc. You guys are creating these sects based on all of your arguments and talk. And that's not how it's going to unfold. The kingdom of God will come with power and judgment. And you guys need to wake up to reality. Yeah, yeah that's it. That's huge. I mean, the, the sobriety concerning the coming judgment, like wake up guys, like stop these little arguments, stop these, this petty, uh, petty bickering, um, in light of the day of judgment. Yeah. Well, one last one that I think is probably, uh, the linchpin of realized eschatology in Paul, the big one is, uh, Colossians one. And so Colossians 1 verses 9 through 14, Paul writes, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. So this one seems pretty already, but not yet at first glance, especially by the way this is translated and, uh, you know, w without a lot of the common 
uh, pictures and, and themes in view in terms of darkness and light, um, understanding a little bit of the Greek here. So what's going on with this one, guys? Is this an example of realized eschatology in Paul or not? Yeah, that, that's, this is another, this is another interesting one. Um, uh, I mean, I, I, this one, this one, you kind of understand a little bit more because people have already imported this this framework of that we've referenced over the last few weeks of, of divine sovereignty, and uh, so you can be transferred into that kingdom in some sort of spiritual sense. So you can understand how people would read that after you've kind of really imported that framework. But I think part of it is is. Like way too much of it hinges on something that we talked about a few weeks back is the is a a really strict and not not to get a really technical but a really strict understanding of Greek of coin Greek basically having certain characteristics that are mostly native to modern languages and um so like we mentioned guys like Stanley Porter a few weeks back and his his work on verbal aspect and his work has been generally accepted in that it's most people acknowledge at this point that that tense is not the primary thing communicated stanley would argue that it's not communicated at all but everybody has at least accepted that what they used to s- communicate as the simple past tense. So he has delivered us from the domain of darkness. So the simple past tense there, that that no longer is essentially acknowledged as a simple past tense. It just it references probably the aspect of of completion that that the or assurance that the event has. And so that's kind of a little bit more of a technical sense, but honestly, this has to do with a lot of misreadings in Paul, whether they specifically deal with the kingdom or not. There's a lot of things that are simply just an over-reliance on what is now acknowledged to be not as reliable as people once thought it was, which is a simple reading of, of Greek tenses. Right. Yeah, and I think you know the 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 overall thrust of the passage uh, is eschatological. You know, where you have the right. same language of walking in a manner worthy of the Lord, where Paul, throughout his letters, that's in light of the eschatological hope of the kingdom and the appearance of Christ Jesus. So he has that same language there. Um, he. It's talking about being strengthened with power and might the same way like at the beginning of 1 Corinthians where he talks about praying that they would be strengthened to the end to be blameless at the on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ uh, for all endurance and patience with joy what you know what are you having endurance and patience for except that you're waiting for his son from heaven <laughs> right. who delivers us from the wrath to come and then right. being qualified to share in the inheritance, nobody questions that the inheritance in Paul is eschatological. Nobody questions that. Exactly. There's nobody, no right. reputable scholar questions if the inheritance is eschatological in Paul. 100% always the inheritance yep. is eschatological in every context. And so leading up to this statement is all the eschatological cues of the inheritance of the saints in light, referencing the age, the glory to come, which creation is groaning for, the light of the age to come, live as in the daytime versus the darkness of this age and the immorality of the Gentiles in the world. And so everything leading up to the statement is eschatological. And then you have this statement of being delivered from the power or the domain of darkness and transferred. And so a lot of it also hinges on the translation of methystomy, which is transferred, in which it nowhere else in the New Testament is it translated as transferred. And almost nowhere else in the Greek world surrounding the New Testament is it uh, 
translated as transferred. Everywhere else, it's translated as to turn or remove. And so it's, you know, five times in the New Testament. Three times are just kind of a real simple, non-theological to remove something. The other time is in Acts 19.26, where it says, uh, this Paul has persuaded and turned away, Methistomy, a great many people. And so the justification for translating it as transferred comes from one instance in Josephus where, where, uh, where the Roman Empire transferred a number of Jews from one place to another. And so, so you get this one reference that got hyped up, you know, however, I forget, like back in the 50s or something, it was, you know, a couple journal articles were written, and you get this one reference in Josephus that becomes the determining factor for translating methistomy as transfer instead of to turn. And so you, if if you look at that and go, well, it makes a whole lot more sense if it's eschatological. He's delivered us from the power of darkness and he's turned us to the coming kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And so taking Colossians 1 as kind of the linchpin for this is proof that Paul is spiritually realizing the Jewish apocalyptic view of the kingdom in his letters and if this is the only real example, then I would say, uh, let's hold Colossians 1 kind of a little bit more lightly rather than <laughs> let's build all of Paul's theology on this one verse. Totally. And this proves that, t- that Paul is redefining everything else that Jews believed at the time. He's reconstructing history. He's realizing it now. And I would say, yeah. I think the context could be argued both ways. I, I think it makes just as much, if not more, sense to argue that Colossians 1 is talking about the Jewish apocalyptic kingdom, yeah. and the rest of his letters fall in line with that very easily and straightforward. But people kind of take Colossians 1 dogmatically and say this one verse, verse 13, proves it and everything else should be interpreted in light of Colossians 1.13. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not yeah. so sure about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, a parallel passage you could reference with Colossians 1 would be Acts 26, Acts 26 verses 16 through 18. And, you know, just this whole real similar language of uh, turning from darkness to light, Right. So I'll, I'll just read it briefly, but rise and stand to your feet for I've appeared to you for this purpose to appoint you as a servant and a witness to the things in which you have seen in me and those who, in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power or same word as in Colossians one as in the domain. Uh, of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So clearly a, a parallel to Colossians 1 here in Acts 26, same sort of image. And I think, yeah, as you're saying, John, I think it can definitely be argued and and probably a much stronger argument could be made for Colossians 1 for Paul to be referencing uh, non-inaugurated, non-realized, not change around the whole story just on this one single verse. So yeah. that's good. Well, before we wrap up today's episode, we just want to briefly touch on one more thing because, you know, in all of our talk on Paul and the apocalyptic, when you engage with these things and material from the academy or you perhaps read some journal articles or something, there's just lots of funny ideas from a movement that uh, sometimes is called the apocalyptic Paul. And so I think rather than just kind of not discussing this at all, I think it, it would be helpful just for listeners, if you ever dig into journal articles, if you ever, you know, read anything from the Academy relating to Paul and apocalyptic, you're going to run into this. So um, what's this all about, guys? For our listeners, let's just develop the apocalyptic Paul movement a little bit. Yeah, so uh, this is a this can get a little bit long and complicated, but just to kind of simplify it, you know, it's the same theme as we talked about in the history of, uh, you know, the development of the kingdom of God uh, in historical studies in the academy in the 20th century. It basically goes back to Schweitzer, Albert Schweitzer, and you know, he p- people seem to. They get a, a very narrow view of Schweitzer, as though Schweitzer 
only Seriously. argued. Seriously. On, yeah, it's really bizarre. Like Schweitzer only argued for this eschatological thing and and excluded everything else. And that really isn't Schweitzer. Schweitzer argued that Jesus was only eschatological until he realized that it was futile. And then he threw himself on the crushing wheels of this age, and he disassembled Jewish apocalyptic thought by his action of the cross. And that Paul picked up right. on this, and he moved it forward and started theologizing that basically through the cross came the divine victory that was kind of the inauguration of Jewish apocalyptic cosmic victory in the cross, and that through that spirit that was expressed in the crucifixion, the spirit carried that forward in what and what Schweitzer called Christ mysticism, in which it's basically a realized eschatology of some sort uh, uh, in a cosmic victory now already, which finds its uh, import, its meaning in the imminent return of Christ. So when Schweitzer talked about Christ mysticism and participation by faith, that's what he kind of had uh the the apocalyptic imagery as the as what gave it meaning and that there's this kind of spiritual victory that's happening now and so but usually that kind of gets brushed yeah. secondary and we don't hear a lot from Schweitzer on Paul you hear a lot about Schweitzer on Jesus um and so but but Schweitzer kind of that's where you get the famous imagery of Paul's theology on the cross was a subsidiary crater to the larger crater, which was eschatology. Uh, but if you don't kind of have this view that Christ mysticism, participation in Christ was kind of a realized eschatology thing for Schweitzer, then you don't get the later development of apocalyptic studies in Paul a, a full kind of idea. So there's a lot of pushback against Schweitzer and then came Boltman and you know, Boltman kind of set up everything as Jewish apocalyptics, all, you know, mythological, and you can demythologize it and set it all aside. At the same time, you have all of the realized eschatology going on. And then you have Ernst Kazeman, who was, you know, Boltman's disciple, and he kind of resurrects Albert Schweitzer and says, no, what what is kind of being discarded by Boltman is actually the center and that the center of Paul is apocalyptic, Jewish apocalyptic, but it's not really Jewish apocalyptic. Uh, yeah. And so Kazaman, <laughs> Kazaman, his favorite uh, phraseology is that uh, Christ was the great cosmocrator. Uh, he was the he was the one ruling at the right hand of God, and that this is kind of the realization of the eschatological triumph or uh, apocalyptic takeover is happening now through Christ at the right hand of God. And that Jewish apocalyptic really gives the meaning and framework for understanding what's happening now, you know, through the Spirit and through Christ. Now, what's novel about Kazaman is that he reinterprets justification to not mean something moral or forensic like in Reformed theology, but rather justification means cosmic apocalyptic triumph happening now, which finds its meaning by the eschatological apocalyptic triumph. And so all of this that's happening after World War II with Kazaman isn't really happening in the English world. People are kind of listening to it. And then comes along J.C. Becker at Princeton, who kind of uh, he systematized Kazaman into the English speaking world and, and ushered in the quote, apocalyptic revolution. And that is where, you know, Becker takes, uh, the, the language of apocalyptic in Judaism and that Paul is kind of taking these and he's appropriating them, uh, to basically mean an inaugurated eschatology and that Jesus is now apocalyptically triumphing over his enemies now already in light of what he will do not yes not yet in the future. And so his book uh uh, uh I forget Paul the Apostle the, the Triumph Paul No, Paul the Apostle the Triumph of God in okay, Life yeah, and yeah. Thought. That's kind of yeah. JC Becker's main book. 
And so from Becker sprouts this this school called the Union School after him by a guy named J. Lewis Martin. And he, uh, Martin was kind of a strange guy. He wrote a long uh, 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 commentary on Galatians where basically he reinterprets Galatians and the statement at the beginning of Galatians where uh, where Paul says, grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age. And so he kind of took this as the, as the, uh, kind of a maxim. It's kind of typifies Paul that the death of Jesus happened to deliver us from this present evil age now. Like rather than a traditional Jewish apocalyptic framework to deliver us from the present evil age at the day of God through the resurrection and the coming kingdom, Martin argued that, no, it's actually a present breaking in an apocalyptic triumph over this present evil age presently that's happening And this is the, quote, apocalyptic Paul, that it's this present apocalyptic triumph. And Martin almost never references, he puts all the emphasis on the now, whereas J.C. Becker put most of the emphasis on the future, the, the the, the parousia of Christ, the coming and appearance of Christ. Martin puts almost all of the emphasis on the now. And so you get this school that kind of developed up after uh, Martin by guys like uh, Martinez, De Boyer, and Beverly Gaventa, and then Douglas Campbell, and recently Philip Zegler, that is, they kind of followed after Martin to put all of the emphasis on this kind of inbreaking warfare invasion theology, and that that is what they mean by the apocalyptic Paul, but it's basically all the same thing. It's all a realization and a redefinition of what first century Jews believed. And a great book on this is uh, J.P. Davies' uh, uh, Paul Among the Apocalypses, where he basically gives a critique of this whole movement. And he critiques it by actually arguing out of Second Temple literature. And that's one of his main critiques, is that this whole union school doesn't seem to understand Jewish apocalyptic thought, because they're totally disconnected from it. Right. All of their arguments have no relation to Jewish apocalyptic <laughs> thought. It's just right. like this internal echo chamber that they've created independent of history and independent of everybody else. It's really a strange phenomenon. And that's kind of the point. That's kind of the point is it has to be disconnected because this is kind of the point of the modern movement is so apocalyptic. They use the apocalyptic as it basically from apocalypse um, apocalypsis in Greek. It just means to reveal or a revelation and so, basically, everything right now the modern the modern conversation is a debate with the new perspective on Paul. Generally speaking, right. if you're into Pauline studies, generally the question is: Are you new perspective? Or are you apocalyptic Paul? And or are you like left behind the you know? Are you left behind with the old perspective, the reform perspective, and <laughs> as N.T. Wright says, the geocentrists right. who will never right. learn? Right. <laughs> <laughs> But the um, so the difference between these two, specifically the new perspective and the apocalyptic Paul, are are basically that that the new perspective led by guys like Wright see the quote unquote Christ event as being the climax of the covenants with Israel, and the entire framework. So the all the apocalyptic Paul guys like to like to emphasize that apocalyptic is a worldview through which Paul sees the world but it's not a Jewish apocalyptic worldview it's an right. apoc- it's an it's a worldview of exactly what has been revealed in the Christ event right and so everything before that is somewhat irrelevant. Don't ask me how you can right. vamp on that for <laughs> 1900 pages but you can <laughs> but I had to do one comment about, you know, Campbell. But anyway, so... Yeah. It's, it's just too easy. It's too easy to bash Campbell. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> so, but that's basically, just to summarize in, in, in this really painful section, is that uh, 
they're all just talking to each other, vamping on realizing eschatology. So one says, no, really, what was revealed in the Christ event was, you know, depending on what they're emphasizing, whether it's the, the, the New Age or in the destru- in destruction of evil forces or, you know, uh, Campbell's view of justification that was, that was, you know, revealed in the Christ event. So uh, all of it is just a conversation, and it's incredibly, re- it's incredibly evident when you read it that they're all just talking to one another. Yeah. Because you can't understand one of them without reading each other, because they don't—they're not kind of standalone work. So that—that—that's that, it in a nutshell, right? And and for me, for me, like new perspective and apocalyptic Paul, in the broad sense, are not that far. And apart. the conclusions are not. The conclusions yeah. are the same, right? right. The end game, you know, is the same moralistic transformation of society now, the, but. The, the kind of what they do with Jewish second temple, Jewish apocalyptic literature and thought is not that much different. Right. New perspective is going to say that Jesus and Paul reinvented or reimagined that Jewish apocalyptic worldview. The apocalyptic Paul guys are going to say Paul kind of he theologized out of that worldview as though it were happening now, that the invasion right. that was previously held to be in the future, the invasion is happening now. But both of those are more or less in the end, they're the right. same thing. And yeah. so, and they're, you know, both of them are kind of a far cry from what a Second Temple Jew, what was the driving factor in their lives, which was the sudden climactic end. Yeah. And yeah. so that's the most ironic thing for me about apocalyptic Paul is that where is the apocalyptic yeah. <laughs> in apocalyptic Paul? Right, right. According to any normal, sane use of the term apocalyptic, it is that there is a dramatic change in history that's tangible and real. It, 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 you know, apocalyptic yeah. Paul guys are going to say, oh, it was a change, a dynamic change in history at the, at, you know, at the cross. And after that, and I would just say, no, the world is the same as it has always been, more or less. Yeah. More or less. Yeah. It's the same. Yeah. And yeah. so all of it does basically the same thing with traditional Jewish apocalyptic expectations, but they all make a big fuss about it and, and <laughs> yeah. say that they're saying totally different things. And it's a, it's a strange echo chamber for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, and listeners, I mean, we, we say all this knowing that, you know, you will come across resources, you'll come across articles, you'll come across books that will espouse these themes, even if they're popular level books. You know, I, I think of kind of N.T. Wright's more popular books, you know, his Simply Jesus or Simply Whatever series. They will simply ascribe this same confusing, very non-apocalyptic perspective. So we say all this to make you aware that when you hear the word apocalyptic in modern academic discussions, most of the time it's not necessary, at least in referring to Paul, the conversation normally does not revolve around primarily Second Temple Jewish apocalyptic ideas in terms of what we've been discussing in this uh, little section here. So be aware, be alert, and know that there's a whole sort of conversation going on that is thoroughly non-apocalyptic in the Second Temple uh, Jew sense of the word. So with that said, <laughs> man, so what? <laughs> this is a long episode today, worthwhile to work through a lot of this, I think, but so what? What is our response? What do we do in light of Paul and in light of his proclamation of the day of God, the Messiah, the kingdom, um, and these first century Jewish apocalyptic themes? Okay, I'll jump in first. And and I, I hope that what can be the fruit of this is that you just don't get lost in the nonsense about Paul. And like when I think of uh when I think of having clarity about how to read Paul and how to use Paul as something that is uh ultimately edifying and strengthening to your faith, um First Corinthians four always comes to mind for me, like in starting in verse nine, where Paul says, For I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all as though sentenced to death because we become a spectacle to the world, to angels and to mortals. We are fools for Christ's sake. 
but you are wise. That, that comes from a little passage above where he's using sarcasm. You are wise in Christ. We're weak, but you guys are strong. Because above he says, you know, have you guys have become kings without the Jewish apostles and whatever. But you are held in honor, but we in disrepute. And he says, but to the present hour, we're hungry, we're thirsty, we're poorly clothed, we're beaten, we're homeless, and we grow and we grow weary from the work of our own hands. We, when we're reviled, though, we bless. And when we're persecuted, we endure it. When we're slandered, we speak kindly in return. We have become like the rubbish of the world, the dregs of all things to this very day. And generally, people read things like this as apostolic distinctives. And I don't think Paul thought of them this way. Paul thought of, Paul was only communicating these things in a fatherly sense. What he says right after this is, I'm not writing this to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children, though you have 10,000 guardians or tutors in Christ, you don't have many fathers. Indeed, in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel, and I appear to you then, be imitators of me. And I think that, that looking at things like this, this biographical information, Paul doesn't intend these things to be his example of how he is apart and unique and nobody else should live this way. He intends to model his behavior and way of life as the path of eternal life. And that's why he says right after this, for this reason, I send Timothy to you, who's my beloved and faithful child, because he's going to remind you of my ways in Christ Jesus that I teach everywhere. So I think the so what is just once you can kind of navigate through the nonsense of Paul, you just look at Paul and look at that he is laying out this way of life this way of entrusting yourself to God in the resurrection that is so provoking and still, even to this present day, stands out with all the missionary stories we have in church history. This guy stands out as if for, for his faith in the apocalyptic expectation is still like exemplary yeah. besides yeah. the Messiah is like second to none. Yeah, for me, I mean, Paul... When I first came to the Lord and, you know, I was raised in a completely heathen background, never opened a Bible. I remember I started reading the Gospels and Jesus was like, whoa, you know, and uh, <laughs> kind of cool. And then I would get into Paul and I would just be like, I have no idea what this guy <laughs> is talking about. And uh, and so, you know, Paul is more complicated because you get all of this other talk about the cross and propitiation, justification, redemption. You get all this talk about the spirit and the, the, the deposit, the down payment. You get this talk about the mission to the Gentiles and all the dynamic dynamics around Torah and observance and circumcision. And so Paul becomes this mess of, of what, how do we even approach these letters and make sense of them. And so for me, the so what is that unless you have kind of his basic framework for history, you can't make sense of anything he says. He's just this wild kind of revolutionary shooting <laughs> from the hip, you know, right. anything goes, whatever's revealed in his prayer closet is what is being laid out in his letters. And it's just like, there's no end to the fantasy. And this has been, you know, since Marcion and on through history, you get these wild deviations that are really rested on Paul's epistles as kind of justification for these crazy ideas in theology. And so, you know, getting kind of a basic idea of what Paul had in mind, like I think of Philippians 3, where he says, you know, one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, straining toward lies, what lies ahead, I press on to the goal of the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus, which of course, right before that is the attaining of the resurrection. And right after that is, you know, when, when, uh, we await from heaven our savior, Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his. And so it's the eschatology. It's, it's, it's the, the, the hope of the kingdom and the resurrection, the day of, of God that is kind of the framework 
that Paul is working out of that makes sense of all of the other kind of novelties that Paul is talking about in his letters. And it makes it so that we can actually receive from that as Paul intended. That was his intent in writing these letters. They were pastoral. They were driven towards discipleship. And that that eschatological framework is what gave grit and bite to Paul's exhortations. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I know we've referenced this already earlier in the episode, but my so what is, once again, 2 Timothy 4, and Paul exhorting Timothy in light of his appearing in his kingdom, in light of the resurrection of the dead, in light of the judgment, to preach the word, but then even his own comments on how he has been faithful to not give up and to persevere through difficulty and suffering. Even right here in First Timothy 4, 6, you know, he says he's being poured out as a drink offering and the time of his departure has come. And he says, even as, as he referenced from Philippians, John, he says, I fought the good fight, I finished the race and I've kept the faith. And so he's looking forward again uh, to, to the day of Christ Jesus to when this crown of righteousness will be given. Um, which the righteous judge will award him on that day, but not only to him, but to all who are loving his appearing, who go on loving his appearing. And I think the takeaway from Paul and all of his letters has to be as something as simple as this, which is to walk away with going, okay, what is the goal? What's the focus? What is the drive? What is the, uh, what is it that we're uh, seeking to attain? And, and I think even your analogy earlier in the episode, I think is a, a super helpful one when you tell your kids, Hey, this is where we're going. We're, we're going to go on a, a great trip and it's, things are going to be awesome, but behave appropriately so that, <laughs> uh, you can actually get on the trip and, and you, you know, do your chores, like live in light of these things. And so I think that, you know, my takeaway is, is exactly this. It is that we, don't get caught up in the craziness of yeah. all of the the little bits of confusion that Paul says. You know, Peter would even say things like, yeah, he writes some things that are hard to understand, but many twist to their own destruction. But we would see the clear and simple framework that he's upholding from the Tanakh, from Second Temple literature, from the words of Jesus, and from the other, the other apostles, a Second Temple Jewish apocalyptic framework that... This is what he's looking forward to, is the day of Christ Jesus, the day of God. And uh, may we be ones as well who also look forward to and go on loving his appearing. Well, listeners, if you've stuck with us this long, um, you you win a, a nice little smiley sticker. <laughs> Thanks for sticking with us through this episode. We hope that it's been encouraging and provoking. And uh, join us next time as we continue our discussion about the kingdom of God and thanks for listening to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. God bless and Maranatha. Maranatha. Thanks for listening to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. For more, visit us on our website at apocalypticgospel.com and follow us on Twitter at Apocalyptic Gospel. 